And so, over the last many years, uh, we have improved our treatment for burns. As a society or as medicine, we're doing much better. Some great things with uh, skin, either synthetic or uh, using the patient's skin for skin drafts has improved. Um, antibiotics, so we've got over many years, that's improved. Our understanding of shock, of burn shock, and our treatment for that, all of that kind of stuff. Um, really, the, the, the most recent stuff is there's some really pretty cool uh, dressings um, that I doubt life or AMR is ever going to have them on call. You guys have the sweet. So there's antibiotic, impregnated, at least with sylvidine type of things, and then uh, some of them have a little bit of lidocaine in them. So uh, they're soothing burn sheets. Uh, pretty expensive. The military uses them. They're wet. Um, and uh, pretty good to go, but they don't really follow. Like it seems like you would cool the patient quite a bit with them. Um, but you're supposed to incorporate them being in a warm area, so at least a warm ambient. So we're treating the hypothermia side, which is going to be kind of a big deal for the burns thing. So the. Uh, a and P of the skin, you need to know that. It's the same piece of uh, um, digital photography that we had from the other one, the uh, dermal layer, the epidermis and such. Um, four functions, it protects the underlying tissue, easy. And number two there is the big, big important one, aids in temperature regulation. And so we, when we get a bad burn, and we're talking then over 20% of the body, our hypothalamus freaks out a little bit, and the actual workers that help us do the temperature regulation, that also uh, is infringed upon because we're not able to vasodilate, vasoconstrict, sweat in that area and help us um, do our temperature regulation. We also have some problems with water. <clears throat> um, and the, the skin helps, you know, because of the nervous tissue, it helps keep our brain on, aware of what's going on and that is limited to because that area has no uh, you know, good or viable nerves. There's a sweet picture that I was talking about. You need to know that kind of stuff. Does anybody have any questions about this picture at all? The worker bees are all in the dermis layer. Do you want us to just know epidermis and dermis, not the hypodermis, and just knowing that like that's the connective tissue? Yeah, I don't think you're going to have much of that at all. Um, the, only the idea of this is, to some degree, this is, in this picture anyways, this is all considered sub-Q. Um, the uh, uh, other places, this just comes up here, and sub-Q is this adipose layer, all right? And then the fascia and the muscle is considered deeper than that. But uh, it, it's a national registry. You can learn it that way if you like. Um, when you talk about a third-degree burn, uh, I'm going to try and stop using third degree and second degree. But when you have that full thickness burn, what does full thickness burn mean? Referencing this picture. It burned down to the muscle, down to the fascia. Um, and the, uh, I think that's a, does anybody like that? The, this area here doesn't have it, um, doesn't have it uh, listed or, pointed out but at the bottom of your skin you have I think what would be called your basement membrane all right and that is what's producing your new skin all right the one way that we basically diagnose a third degree burn is you're not able to to build your skin there so we have to skin graft a third degree burn and skin drafting go together everybody believe on that so uh, it at least is full thickness full thickness down to this area, all right, where your basement membrane, your basement membrane isn't where your fascia is, it's in between there, does that make sense? So that's where this becomes like, oh, which picture are you going to use today, the one that shows some cue in the fascia or this or that, all right, and uh, to, if you, uh, you know, I would say definitely, and I think these are going to start coming out, advanced burn life support classes, I'm quite sure I just heard that there's some grant money there, so that would be like a free seven-hour course, pretty good stuff, 
all right? But if you think I'm going to make it confusing, <laughs> they, there is all kinds, because we have three degrees, right? You know, three different levels, but there truly is much more that is kind of has some implication to us too. Guess what? It's not in the PHLS book, <laughs> so it's not that big of a deal. Well, let's just concentrate on what we need to know, you know, to get through the National Registry. It's not that big a deal, but Burns, uh, you know, you, we're all going to come across burn patients. I don't think knowing the difference between a partial thickness and the different levels of partial thickness and then uh, uh, full thickness and how bad the full thickness is, that's all. When you're a nurse and a doctor working in a burn unit, that is a better or more of a consideration. It doesn't really impact us that much, all right? But if you're taking care of a patient over a long period of time, that it starts to have some implication. So one of the big things is early on in your burn assessment, here we're just coming across, you know, burn assessment is in patient assessment, taking care of or managing your patient. We're gonna have a primary survey um, we have to think about our safety. We're not going to go into burning buildings or anything like that. But when we have this patient here, let's just, we have to now we have to use our imagination. Here's the doorway. It's all on fire. They called us for the standby. We get there right after them. These guys are going to try and save the basement. Um, and a guy comes walking out. All right. So let's say a firefighter, some hero walk ran in there. They got him. Now they're walking this guy out. The guy has just been put up, like, let's get this stuff, drop and roll type of thing. He's up and walking towards us. What's our priority? He stopped, dropped, and rolled. Now he's walking towards us. What's that? Stop the burn is our priority. All right, stop the burn. So if, and remember, my thing was he's walking towards us. Stop the burn is our priority. Now, if the person is unconscious on the ground, we might think airway may have some, some, some importance there, right? But um, one of the things that I think is something that not here at the academy, it was everybody, for a while, we were all about, if their burn's bad, don't use wet dressings, right? And so that ended up being interpreted, no cooling, bad burns all right so luckily i would say for the last 20 years we've been teaching it right all right when we have bad burn patients our first thing is stop <coughs> the burning process very high priority the longer we allow them to have superheated skin or hot skin um, that burn is getting worse so we can douse them with water to begin with all right Remember, the reason that we have to make a decision between a dry dressing and a moist dressing is a moist dressing will allow cooties to get through it more than a dry dressing, but almost all of the patients are hypothermic and wet dressing will make them more hypothermic, all right? The infection is something we should consider, but they don't like get the bug and die and then we arrive at the hospital, <laughs> right? That's when they die two days, three days later. And we have some pretty dang good antibiotics for that. So we shouldn't get too wrapped around the uh, axle about not wanting to use a wet dressing because it's gonna get the, let the cooties through. We should worry more about the hypothermia. Now, in my mind, that might not make so much sense, but it is what our curriculum says. Well, I'm not so sure hypothermia is not so good or bad for them. We don't, there's no good research that says, there's a, there's a lot of research that says patients who, who show up at burn units are hypothermic. There's not a lot of data that says that's bad, <laughs> right? But from our curriculum perspective, it's bad. Our understanding of hypothermia anyways, there's not, they're not bleeding to that. So we're not worried about a coagulopathy. I'm not so sure hypothermia is so bad for them, but we're still not supposed to allow people to be hypothermic. This is something, this would be new news, I think. I don't think we talked about this very much in preparatory. Advanced EMTs don't need to know these zones of coagulation. So the, when somebody is burned, and this can be a chemical, to some degree electrical, most of the time with this, we're talking about thermal burns. And thermal burns, I think, is a, this is called Jackson's zones 
of, uh, of a burn. You have a zone of coagulation. And that zone of coagulation is where the where that blood was while we were getting burned. It evaporated the water out of there because of the super, superheated nature of the burn. And that coagulated and that tissue is going to be kind of non-viable. That is a great place to have a third degree burn then. The zone of stasis is an area around the zone of coagulation where you're going to have a problem with blood flow, limited blood flow and some vasoconstriction gunked up. When, when you have an egg, you crack the egg open, you have a yolk. What else is there with the yolk? Egg white? Is it white? It's clear. Why do you call it egg white then? It turns white. Oh, we're not talking about cooked eggs. So what else? What is that? What is that clear thing? And I 100% believe it's egg white thing too. But what is what is the what is that clear stuff? What is that for? The yolk stuff. Feed the yolk. To feed the yolk. <laughs> right, good. Good. And so what's in it? Protein. Protein. Um, we should probably Google this, but I think that's called albumin. Yes, albumin. Is that what they call it down in Mexico? Yes. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to believe then. When I said it today, everybody looked at me like I was lying. I was like, maybe it's not. Maybe I just always called it albumin. So, and we have albumin in our bloodstream, right? 70% of the protein in our body is albumin. All right? And that's circulating uh, protein, I should say. So most of it's albumin. When we superheat albumin in an egg, it turns to the egg white. All right? Can you, if you can imagine the, the egg clear, egg, what did you call it? The yolk sac. <laughs> so that, you can, you can kind of imagine that going through our vessel, right? And not having such a big hard time with it. But once we crack it and fry it in a pan or burn it, um, that albumin becomes denatured. All right? So we denature our egg. We can denature the protein. So where that is happening is where that definitely in the coagulatory area, the center area, but it's also the zone of stasis where we have limited or poor blood flow. And then hyperemia is going to be increased. That's where we have the edema. That's where we have all the other stuff that we talk about when we have an inflammatory response, hyperemia, reddened, painful, all of that kind of stuff. Here's just that same thing, but here, the reason that I have the second picture is this isn't just the, the burn is getting bigger this way. The longer we allow it to stay superheated, the bigger problem we're going to have with the zone of coagulation will go deeper. The zone of stasis will go deeper. It's not two-dimensional, three-dimensional. Don't blow a trumper in your eyes. That's what that one says. Um, so pathophysiology, burns are soft tissue injures, injuries created by destructive energy transfer via radiation, thermal, um, and then it could be electrical energy. What is actually happening is water evaporates and proteins denature. All right. So I don't think this is National Registry stuff. I think it, as paramedics, we'd have a good understanding of like, like what, what is actually happening? Well, the water's all evaporating right out of the cell, out of the interstitial area, out of the dermis, out of all of that area. The, the water is just gone. We're going to limit blood flow to that area, and that is in a short period of time going to cause ischemia, infarction, infarcted type of stuff. When we have that burn, we're, we are going to have that zone of hyperemia, and we are going to release catecholamines. Your hypothalamus freaks out a bit when we have a major burn. All right, Your hypothalamus stops working correctly as your temperature regulation. And you have a severe hampered temperature regulation because where you're burned, you're no longer able to use that as burn or uh, temperature regulation. 
So we're going to have a fluid shift, all right? And we talk about this fluid shift, man, we're only on like slide number four or five. So early on in the burn uh, lecture, we're already talking about this fluid shift, and it's a big part of, of um, burn shock. But this part, when we talk about burn shock, and this is on a slide later on, that isn't immediate, all right? So the tricky question is, you're taking care of this patient with 20% burn who just came out of a, a structural fire, and his blood pressure is 80 over 50, his pulse is 150. What, what do you think about that? And what is, he's in burn shock, and he's not in burn shock. Burn shock is four hours later six hours later, eight hours later. That's when we worry about burn shock. If he's in shock now, we should be looking for why is he in shock? Is this also a trauma? Did he fall while he was in there? Is there something else going on that's causing him to have such a low blood pressure? His blood pressure should be high right now with a big old catecholamine rush from the burn. Tissue damage reduces your ability to Keep your core temperature. We said that already at least twice. And there's going to be less oxygen transported to the tissue. The burn process can lead to renal failure. All right. And a big part of this is electrical injuries. So, you know, but just regular burn. Electrical injuries, in my mind, it's easy to see that. Like we have an entrance wound and an exit wound, and we don't see all the damage, but all of the muscle from here to there could have been severely damaged. Damaged muscle releases what? Go ahead, Michael. Damaged muscle equals good job. Myoglobin. We have to remember that. All right. So it's already been important in two different lectures. So this one is even more important. So crush syndrome is important, and in burns, it's important. You know, when we've talked about crush, who here has been on a crush syndrome patient? Right? Um, has anybody been, had a patient had high myoglobin levels? I had one uh, when I was a chief for the Marines on the other side of the state, one of the active duty Marines started doing P90X. And if you took like the mentality of a Marine and P90X, something's going to go wrong. So he was doing a pyramid, which is you get up and do one pull up and then two pull ups and then three pull ups and then I quit about right there. But they go four pull ups, five pull ups, six pull ups, 20, 10 pull ups, 10 pull ups, and then you go back down. That's, that's the P90X back. Um, he did that and did other stuff. And uh, before you knew it, he was having back pain and uh, a problem peeing. So he went to the hospital. He called, the, called that chief, the active duty chief, and the active duty chief said, uh, take two Motrin and call me. I'll, I'll see you on Monday. This was a Friday night when, he, when this happened, and, or Friday night when he did it. Saturday morning is when he's calling uh, not Chief Fretz, but the other guy. Uh, and so he ends up just going, okay, goes to the emergency room, ends up with these just phenomenal numbers of myoglobin. All right, his myoglobin was through the roof. He's telling me like what it was. It was like in the 10,000. It's like, mm, you probably don't know your numbers very well. But uh, that's what you, you know, he was saying. It was just uh, astronomical. So this is, I don't see him. I, I only go there once a month. So during that month, he was in the hospital for a week <laughs> on huge amounts of IV fluids. He had all these big numbers. Like I was going through 10 IV fluids a day. And they were just trying to get me a pee. And for a little while, they thought I was going to have to eat. I don't think he did dialysis, but I thought they were, he was thinking my kidneys are shutting down and I could die. He was like, I could have dog died. And that chief said, take two ibuprofen and come in on Monday morning. So here is, a, has anybody been on a call where they had a geriatric female who fell and couldn't get up? Yeah, all the time. All right. So, that's what our curriculum should talk about, all right? So um, I can't even, I don't even know how many times, but then now we have to kind of pick into that, like how many times were they on their bedroom floor in maybe a weird position and they had to wait for a long time before somebody came in and told them how to use the phone, all right? 
So, and that some of them are in between the bathtub and the toilet. And they also complained about like, I can't feel my arm <laughs> because it's just, it just fell asleep. It was just, I couldn't get off of my arm. That is who we should worry about. Not the farmer and the guy who was crushed into the thing and not the guy who doesn't know how to work on a press anymore. So those guys, we're not gonna get those cool ones, all right? We're gonna get 89 year old female who fell and can't get up, all right? We can't get off from her arm and now she stands. And the other side of it, it's gonna be a near late call for us. And we're like, boom, lift us this, Doop, here you go. We're out of here, sign right here, we're out. And she has huge myoglobin levels when they uh, when they figure out that she can't pee anymore. And that can, that can be a death sentence if you're 89 years old, all right? So you guys don't know Buzz. Buzz's wife is a nurse. She works now at, you guys might see her, at the Children's Hospital. Um, the, uh, she used to be butter work, and she said that she would tell Buzz all the time, like, why don't you guys know this? That old ladies who lay down uh, and they have, you know, lost feeling to their whole arm or their legs because of a weird position, that's everything. That's everything. It's, the myoglobin shouldn't uh, build up as quickly as what we're talking about for crush syndrome because there's not damaged, damaged tissue, but it does damage it. It does release myoglobin. All of that stuff is true. All right. So, like, if uh, I had a patient who was sitting on the toilet and she couldn't get up and it was yes. like eight hours that she was on the toilet perfect yeah so it'd be like that situation yeah that's the ones where you can talk you can talk them into going to the hospital she went and, and yeah. you can say yes this is this is the reason you have poor poor circulation start throwing out acidosis hyperkalemia microemboli and some rhabdo all right and if I, if I talk to the hospital they are going to tell you to go to the hospital because of this and that and we should then be doing a 12 lead looking for this potential for hyperkalemia, right? All of that stuff is there. Um, Sandy, which is buzzing, she had like, she's like, yeah, they're like, some of them died. <laughs> they're ones that we did list of assists and didn't bring them to the hospital, all right? And they're, they're coming in and now not peeing anymore and all of this. And the family said, yeah, they were here, you know, yesterday she did this, she had to, you know, Rockford ambulance came over and say that, right? Nobody, so the, uh, and, and, uh, we thought she was okay, and now she's not peeing anymore or anything like that. Um, I don't know why this slide reminded me of that. I should have talked about it before. Um, and again, I, like if I were writing questions for the National Registry, that's what I would do. It wouldn't be the earthquake in California. It would be the 80-year-old female who has her arm still behind her back laying next to her bed, and that's it. That's rhabdo. That's everything that we talk about. That she fell there. Um, so burn process doesn't have to be electrical. It's an easy one for me. But all burns, you're going to have myoglobin from the burns. If the burn was deep enough to get to the muscle, third degree, uh, full thickness, then we have a myoglobin problem. So that gives us another reason to start that Parkland formula or giving a whole bunch of IV fluid early on, not just to revitalize tissue or to make up for the fluid that we're gonna be losing. It is neuro, uh, renal protective to give them a lot of fluid. May cause circulatory compromise, compartment syndrome, compartment syndrome because, right? Um, when a person is burned, the skin acts as a barrier is destroyed. So now they're going to be more potential for infection. That's what we worry about in a couple of days. That's nurses are going to worry way more about that than us, right? We should think about hypothermia. Think about treating for shock. Really, our, I think our main focus, because I'm not that worried about the hypothermia. No one's really told me why that's so bad. We just generally say it's bad. Pain control and uh, renal protection, all right? So lots of fluids and given 100 mics of fentanyl or whatever you like, ketamine, any of those would be great. Burn shock occurs because of two types of injury, fluid loss across the damaged skin and a volume shift, right? So remember this here, if I called this a capillary bed and we were talking about filtration, there's pre-capillary here, post-capillary, what is it that pushes water out into the tissue to be 
filter. What pushes the water out? Hydrostatic. Hydrostatic blood pressure. So hydrostatic. So that's as easy as your blood pressure. If you don't have a blood pressure, you don't have this. So it's a ghost. What pulls it back in? Oh, oh. oh. Oncotic. Oncotic pulls it back in. What gives us oncotic pressure? <laughs> Not so here. What gives us our oncotic pressure? Oh. I've used the word several times. <laughs> Protein. Yeah. Sounds like potassium. Albumin. Protein. Albumin is what 70% of that is. Pushed out with blood pressure, pulled back with albumin. Do we have as much albumin as we used to? No, we denatured a bunch of it. All right. So now, since we don't have that, water leaks out and stays in the interstitial area. We have that zone of hyperemia and we freak out. So we can have a bunch of you know, inflammatory, I shouldn't say freak out. We have a big inflammatory reaction, and that's going to cause increased permeability. So we're going to have both sides of the thing going because we also have adrenaline, right? So we have adrenaline that's going to cause some vasoconstriction. We have anti-inflammatory that's going to cause vasodilation. It's going to be happening in a big burn. It can happen all over our body, not just where the burn is. Again, it's kind of because I like to just say the hypothalamus freaks out. But it's not doing it right, but a lot of that is not neural control. It's just tissue that is inflamed. It's going to be inflamed tissue, that's, and it goes outside of the edges of the of where your burn actually is. So again, we use a term like oozes. All right, for us to get into burn shock, push it out four hours. All right, if we're in shock, the person's just burned. We have them in the in the emergent phase, low blood pressure, all the signs of shock, look for something else. Look for trauma, look for whatever else you can, sepsis, whatever it was, you know, why are they, why do they have a low blood pressure? It's not because of this. You should probably have a high blood pressure because of pain. In the oozes, that's third spacing. Yeah, yeah. Was third spacing also on there or not? No. Third spacing is right. Um, so here's the burns. We know what a uh, superficial burn is and a partial thickness. We have a full thickness there at the at the bottom. Um, I, I I will go to the advanced burn life support. There's going to be some in this area, I think, and they'll be free. So as a Dutchman, it's what, right up my alley. Um, I I've just seen like from the state, they, there's definitely grant money there, um, and they want us to have this uh, advanced burn life support stuff. Dr. Wang, you guys know who Dr. Wang is. We should start doing our discussion forums, <laughs> all right? So Dr. Wang does the discussion forums. He's also, he does a lot of stuff. He, he, he talks at a lot of our, our like EMS expos and our EMS IC classes. He's also in charge of our um, tr burn triage. So if like it's kind of a, a uh, terrorist event where we have hundreds of people who are burned really bad, um, he, he, he he's the guy. He's the one who made the protocol. He's the one who's responsible for mass casualty burn problems in Michigan. Um, and uh, that entity and stuff, I think Dr. Wang probably has something to do with that. They've got uh, a bunch of money to give us advanced burn life support. When you go there, they, there's more than three. <laughs> All right, they complicate this in a, in a bigger, much bigger way. The second degree or the partial thickness is, is kind of categorized as wet, wet and dry. All right. And the third degree is how bad <laughs> does it go further? All right. If, are we burning away bone? Is there nothing left? All right. So th those are further degrees that uh, that if you wanted, you could talk about. I, I like that training, but again, we're at, we need to get past the natural registry. All right. So these are pretty easy. Some Something to think about is we, we shouldn't really at our level of say, <laughs> third degree. Because <laughs> a third degree burn really by its definition is that basement membrane isn't working and you're not revitalizing tissue, all right? You're not gonna know that, all right? There's very often you're not gonna know that. We're not gonna keep 
poking it and going, did that hurt? Did that hurt? Does that hurt? Does that hurt? Because that's another good way is we know they burned away their nerves, all right? Uh, a lot of times the patient's freaked out and you're not going to be able to do a good assessment of this is the board or where it's hurt and where it doesn't hurt to, to try to differentiate second and third degree. We often, when we say second degree or partial thickness, what's present? Partial thickness, we have blisters. So guess what? You don't have to have blisters. It can still be a second degree. Second degree is burnt through the dermis, burnt to the dermis, right? It's more than superficial. And sometimes the blisters are just gone now. And sometimes it's just that you're going to develop blisters later. And sometimes you just don't get them, but you have that same effect of the burn, all right? Just so you know, it is more complicated than what we need to know um, at, at a new paramedic level, but I would encourage you to do the advanced burn life support after your paramedic, maybe even after a couple of years. Uh, it really is a, a pretty good course. I went to it uh, like in the late 80s. All right? Again, it was Blodge, it was our burn center, and they put on uh, like a seven hour advanced burn life support courses. It's a two day course. I think they were four day advanced burn life support course for nurses and doctors. And then there was a two day course then in the Blodgett thing that they did pretty much, I think, captured all of that. Um, the only, no practicals except we went to where a, nerd, a burn, burn unit nurse had a bunch of mannequins that had all these different burns on it. We went around and uh, basically recorded the get body surface area and how much fluid we would give, that kind of stuff. That was the only practical that we had. So superficial burns, um, you know, epidermis only, skin is red and swollen, heals spontaneously, three to seven days, everybody gets it. So we don't have blisters here, we just have peeling skin, right? Everyone here, or from Michigan. So partial thickness burns here, underneath here, we can kind of see the guy has blisters. But um, we see this picture again later on. There's definitely some third degree or some full thickness with some blisters around it. We know that hurts a lot, right? Um, and then uh, he should be able to, uh, you know, he may have some scarring, but he should be able to regenerate skin with that and be okay. A full thickness burn, where does it say, talk about it? It says the skin may be white, waxy, brown, leathery, or charred. And I like that all the way up to charred, because charred can be first degree burns, all right? If you uh, put your hand into warm ash on the morning after your campfire, it can look really bad, but when you get it all washed off and everything, you have a first degree burn, and it'll hurt, it'll hurt really bad, but it's a first degree burn, pretty much. Um, with a full thickness, we all know nerves are destroyed there, so we uh, don't have pain. So when we look at this patient, we would then go charred. This charred has to be then maybe third degree. But again, if we're in a thermal burn, being burned with stuff that has ash, that could give us what looks like charred skin. This white area, again, you should push towards, that's full thickness burn. But if you really want to know if you, at the edges is where you'd be thinking of it, is it blanching yet or not? Do we have some blood that's going into that area? If you have blood that's going into that area, blood is in the dermal layer, all right? So you have a partial thickness there, all right? So the uh, uh, definitely has uh, edema here. We have, it's hard to see, but there was um, blisters, but the blisters are now gone, all right? People aren't going to be really careful and keep all their blisters intact when they're getting extricated and things of that sort. So those blisters will be uh, ruined. This is actually the same picture that we had before. Um, and we can see there's actually some tissue loss there here. All right, so it's contracted in a little bit where, you, where that is. That's almost assuredly a third degree surrounded by second degree. Again, second degree, probably a, a full thickness in the middle there in the back of the hand. Here on the front of the hand, we have a blister. Has anybody burnt themselves in the front of their hand where you had a blister? Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a good temperature, <laughs> right? That's a high heat that you did that with, or you left it there for a little bit too long. Um, and what do we that what do we say as far as burn criteria? It's yeah. 
high priority doesn't mean we have to go lights and sightings to the hospital, but what they say is it's important that that guy's seen at a burn center because they know how to take care of that, all right? If you burn the, your hands, you may not be able to use that hand, and that's how the nurses, the nurses are trained to help you with that. Uh, what burn, what would you say that burn is? Yeah, it's probably partial thickness. Would you try to say, well, is any of that moving towards some evidence of third degree or full thickness? Let's see, does this work? Nope. On the bottom part where we have this area here? Like here? Yeah. Maybe like right here is what you're saying, yeah. I was thinking this part right here where it's white and wax, <laughs> kind of. Um, this is moulage, but again, we don't know what's what here, all right? When we start to see this red in here, that's the dermal layer that's opened up. It's abrased, basically, now. That could be a deep superficial, a deep partial thickness, and the skin is gone now, all right? Doesn't necessarily mean it's a third degree. There's a lot of evidence towards that, but nowhere on that slide did we see red and bloody. Now, who's going to know is the doctor, after we figure out, is this tissue regenerating or not? If this tissue is not regenerating, it's a full thickness. If it is able to, we have partial thickness. A lot of second degree with probably, uh, right? You see the blisters there? That's not two days after a sunburn and a peeling. That is some big old second degree of partial thickness burns. For the rule of nines, again, we have had these two slides when we were in uh, preparatory is this is from the internet. Important thing to see is 18% and 18% in our book has 12%. That's just a little bit of a change between those two uh, years, right? So I would call that guy a three-year-old. Everybody good with that? He's definitely walking around. Maybe a two-year-old. So once you get into that eight-year-old, you're, you're probably going with a 9%, all right? Same as us. So but when we're lo less than that, we're going to go with a 12%, and then infants are down to 18%. I have a feeling since uh, we can go with these, uh, that, uh, with this one, it's going to be all over the place on the internet. All right. So National Registry is probably going to keep with this one and this one. <laughs> all right. Um, the big, the best thing to try to remember, not memorize, but remember is. The thing that changes is the head, and we subtract them from their legs. <laughs> the arms are always the same. Chest is always the same. Abdomen is always the same. Their genitals are always the same, right? The place that changes is their lower to the, uh, the, the two extremes. This is the Lund Browder, all right? And so this is going to be just like our med drill. I'm going to have you guys memorize all this. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, we don't have to memorize this. You just have to remember what a Lund Browder chart is. All right. Nobody has to memorize this. All right. Like if you're in the burn unit, you just this is the way they document it. So they have the chart right in front of them. So there's no reason to. The way the National Registry would ask a question is which of the following would be a more accurate way of figuring that out? And it's Lund Browder chart. That's, all, that's, that's it. You wouldn't have to say on the Lund Browder chart, they say half the head is nine and a half. Here's another explanation of it. It's, a, it's called the Lund Browder chart. Everybody good with that? No memorization, just an under, just a thing that that's the way they are going to document it beyond our time. So a progression, in the, we have that inflammatory response. Inflammatory response. So inflammatory, remember, vasodilation, all right? Loss of fluids. So first two days, um, we're going to have that inflammatory response. During that one or two days, we can have progression of the of the wound. All right. See, I wouldn't make such things up. This is from the slide. It says it extends damage and depth. All right. So what we what we may say, oh, this thing's like a partial thickness, could end up being a full thickness burn. All right. I feel more on the optimist side is some things that we think are going to be a Full thickness may only be partial thickness. We don't know how bad the basement membrane is. 
or uh, maybe we treat them really aggressively and well and they get better. Um, then we have a severe, let's see, this is a progression, all right? So inflammatory response is the first time we have a, uh, damage getting worse, severe fluid loss. It's hours to days, hours to days, not minutes after, hours later. And then sepsis is how they die days after that. Reduced circulation extends the depth. That's why we like to do fluids. Um, Management, limit the progression. <laughs> Pretty good stuff. How do we do that? Cool them as soon as possible. Some IV fluids early. Inhalation burn. So we have this guy. Um, what evidence do we have of inhalation burns for him? Soot. Soot in the mouth. It's on his tongue. What was that? His nose. And in his nose, we got some black boogers. Um, we might have some what looks like maybe burned off singed hair would be a good one, right? Mm -hmm. So what looks like maybe burnt lips, burnt area here and here. So we, this guy is now talking quietly and we hear uh, with his inhalation. What do we do for him? Oxygen. When you've tried to enter him, he goes, no. What do we do? What's going to happen to him in the next 30 minutes? He's going to swell shut. He's going to close his airway. All right. We should anticipate him closing the airway. So what are some sexy things that we could say we can do? All right, I'll wait. I'll do a surgical one. <laughs> That's probably it. All right, so some cool things, and I don't know the answer here. All right, so some things. First, there's RSI. All right, so RSI, uh, these guys are known to be, uh, you know, if we got two of them late, then they're hyperkalemic. They can't use succinylcholine with hyperkalemia. When you go to a difficult airway class, when, when paramedics are taught RSI, most of the class is who we don't RSI. <laughs> and you, it's like figuring out, is this someone that can innovate? This is a difficult innovation. And if this airway is really small, it's even more difficult. If this is all getting bigger and his airway is getting smaller um, and he's going to be conscious for a while, so you RSI him, now you have an unconscious person who's not breathing and you're going to be putting this into a burnt up area that's actually fragile too. All right. So this one from RSI, I would say, no, this, this is a trick. Don't RSI. But I don't know. The other one is conscious sedation. So how do we do conscious sedation? We as paramedics, what would you give? You wanted to intubate this guy and you are not RSI, which most paramedics can RSI, right? Usually helicopter paramedics and some ground ambulances RSI. I think even in Michigan, maybe somewhere on the other side of the state, they have RSI Livingston County, maybe. What do you think? What is conscious sedation? What are we going to do? You like ketamine? And what was that? Verset. How much? Ten. <laughs> you go big. That's good. I usually say your ten might be the right answer, um, but uh, first we have to start an IV on this guy then. All right, and now we're sitting on scene, starting an IV or doing an IO. Um, and I would say, I've always said like three to five of Verset, all right? And if I say that in front of like Aeromed nurses, they're like, you really think Verset's that good? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a lot of experience giving more than like two, two and a half of Verset, all right? I just, I, I, I don't have that experience. And from the Aeromed nurses, they're like, you just give that much for said. You can't just go around putting laryngoscopes in people's mouths. They don't like it. Um, but I think if you're going up to 10 milligrams, you're also really risking them stop breathing. All right. And then you very often can share that with some fen fentanyl. All right. And then now we're going to be giving some anti-anxiety stuff and some sedation with that and some anti-pain. That all sounds good. Ketamine sounds good, but I like ketamine dripping it over time and such to get to where you want to be. 
ketamine, I think, is a great answer, but now we're even outside. I'm really going to not feel comfortable doing it because I haven't even given ketamine yet. So I've just read a lot about it. So that's what, you know, you'll be telling to the family, don't worry, you know, I've, I've read a lot about this. <laughs> I've never done it. But it's going to really come. But, it's, but we don't have to worry about his respirations when we're giving ketamine. Ketamine and his respiration should be fine. That's, I don't know what the right answer is. Um, but you have to give a lot of those drugs to get them to, to, um, to where they'll take a laryngoscope down their mouth. If they're saying, oh, no, thank you. Just bring me to the hospital. Um, I think at the National Registry, they don't want you to be a cowboy. This is cool. I would think that's cool. I would think that some people would do that. It's not the wrong, wrong answer. But I think at the National Registry, as you're going through candidacy, we're looking for minimum competency. <laughs> and they're going to be saying, just get to the hospital. This is more than likely, this is a surgical airway. All right, a surgical airway. What else? would be a good wrong answer. What would be a good wrong answer for me to put on to this? OPA and NPA. OPA and NPA aren't going to help this guy at all, right? First of all, he has a gag reflex, so he won't take an NPA. You guys notice that his nares have, now when we start pushing an NPA through that, that's fragile tissue. So a, a nasal innovation sounds really cool too, right? but now you're gonna spring a leak. Now he's gonna have blood in the back of the airway too. And this is where the closure is. So, uh, so a nasal airway to begin with is, is hard. Now we have a, a, a closed airway that you're gonna try and get it through. It's probably not gonna work. For that guy, it's, oh, give me your hand. <laughs> Let's get in the back of the ambulance and it's drive, all right? And then I would be getting ready to do a surgical airway. So that's with everything. With. The only scalpel I had was in an OB kit. <laughs> I would have that open. I would get the endotracheal tube out. All of that stuff would be there, ready for that guy to to need, you know, to, to let me do that. Which is going to probably be, he's now hypoxic and decreased level of consciousness. He's now not going to be fighting me, uh, but I can't now. I'm not going to be able to get an airway through because it's all closed off. So you go to. The, you know, you're going to waste a whole bunch of time, time trying to learn just kind of like intubation where you could just go in, slice, slice, cut. now you got a tube. So we can, we're, we're National Registry paramedics, so we can do surgical, right? Kent County paramedics, we don't do surgicals. But Montcalm, you probably do. You guys have a sweet little kit and everything? I don't think we can. I think we have the same protocols as you. Oh, really? It's worth looking. It's usually a checkbox, and ours says we can yeah. do a needle crisis, which I don't have a lot of good for that. I don't know, Allegan, you you might be able to. Well, that, that's what I've, I've never seen that. Well, Army was always crisis. That was the only airway I learned, which is exactly. weird. Yeah. <laughs> they never covered innovation or anything. You know, it used to be all the way through the 80s. They're like, it's much easier to just teach innovation and you don't have to carry around so much stuff. You know, innovation, we like, how many times did we innovate mannequins, you know, to get to where our low level of competency is? I'm not making fun of you at all. We don't have a great level of competency. Surgical airways is not hard to teach somebody. Uh, you don't have that much equipment. It's just a little airway that you can put in or some other, uh, you know, thing that you could find to put in the airway to give them an airway. So that used to be the big training for Vietnam and all the way through the 70s and 80s. That was it. For even now, the Navy corpsmen, they don't they don't get a lot of time behind a laryngoscope. So we're supposed to be awesome at trauma care. It's all from experience of trying to take care of patients. There's less surgical airways now as, as far as the Navy tri side. And they give all this high speed stuff, but I have feeling we're not that good at it. <laughs> we just had to get the patient to the nurses and doctors. On. So smoke inhalation, thermal burns, hypoxia, tissue damage, all kinds of easy stuff. And then carbon monoxide. We all covered that, I think, well enough when we were in um, toxicology. So we know what, that, what why that's bad. Remember cyanide, if we're burning carpet and cushions and such, cyanide is up there too. Burn severity is like who should go to a burn unit. And so when we blow this up a little bit, this is 
kind of worth memorizing. It's, some of it is kind of, comp, of is, is maybe you might say common sense, but you see what I mean there. So full thickness burns involving their hand space, blah, 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 blah. Not hard to remember. So this isn't, they're going to die if they don't get to a burn center. They're going to get the best care, right? Because you burnt the palm of your hand doesn't mean you're going to die. If you burnt your genitals, doesn't mean you're going to die, all right? But the best care is at the burn center. So it's a high, pri high priority to get them to the right place. Full thickness burn, full thickness, third degree burn over 10% of the body, all right? So the way I like to remember that is nine, <laughs> all right? So all of this is, that's nine. I can round up to 10. And that's going to be, it really helps that person to be in a burn center. Um, a partial thickness covering more than 30% of the body's total surface area. This number used to be 20%, so that one screws me up a lot. Uh, burns associated with respiratory, makes sense, get them there. Uh, complicated by fractures, doesn't make sense. <laughs> and then burns with a uh, younger than 5 and older than 55, so really old and really young. Same thing as that trauma criteria. Um, and then here, so this second area was, um, uh, you know, one down, <laughs> right? This isn't, isn't, isn't as bad as this. So full thickness burn, 2% to 10%, um, and then partial thickness, 15 to 30, and superficial burns uh, over 50% of your body, all right? And now it's important, but not critical for them to go to a burn unit. So this guy's dumb enough to, like, be in the sun and then to turn over <laughs> and burn both sides so and then the full thickness of two percent of your body it's the only thing like less than two to ten percent of your body the other things kind of make sense then um i don't know if it's worth memorizing a lot of that stuff makes sense remember like these things are by themselves so really we're looking at the ten percent and thirty percent and then two to ten and then the other one was 15 to 30. so 30 percent you have to remember and then i kind of make up this 15 to 30 or so they're probably you're gonna to have to choose between these two all right and remember that when they're really young and when they're really old not really old 55 isn't too old uh when they're geriatric age they're definitely going to be the higher and it's more critical for them to get to a burn center so when we're taking care of a burn we're going to evaluate the burn body surface area and such. Um, cut clothing around. Uh, they don't want you to pull, pull clothing out that's adhering to the skin. An early on thing is removing the jewelry. All right, if you remove that jewelry, it won't have to get cut off later. It might be very easy for you to do it and very difficult for someone else to do it. Start your large bore IVs, hopefully too. If you have to go through a burn, you can go through a burn, all right? Don't use alcohol. <laughs> it's an open burn. You just push it through. All right. So the bacteria has been burned off. So it's good skin. You just put your IV through it and, uh, and tape it down with clean. All right. That's all you'll have for that. If that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. Uh, pain management. So a big part of what we're going to do is give fluids and manage pain. And that's going to be like you're, you're going to be starting at 50s and 100s of, of fentanyl. Ketamine is a great one. All right, ketamine if you're comfortable with it. And you might as well do, do some anti-anxiety too. Versed and fentanyl would be great. Uh, ketamine by itself would be okay. Is it Haldol down there? No. Probably not Haldol. I could see, we don't have to know those, but propofol and what is the other good? What is what that nurses usually use that is a benzo? Atomidate, that's a benzo, right? Atomidate would be another thing that you see in the ER. What is Atomidate? What is that classification? I don't think it's a benzo. I'm not sure exactly what it is, though. So, um, but for us, Versed or Valium and, uh, and a narcotic would, or an opiate would be, sound good. Ketamine, kind of by itself, could be good. Probably start at what we start at, like, I like to say 0.25. I think it's 0.2, right? 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. Bump that up to. 0.5 milligrams per kilogram pretty quickly. And you can redose those. So uh, 10 minutes later, start giving them some more. Deteriorating airway, fix it. All right. This, again, 
that RSI is not a great answer. That was on that thing, that's to talk about it, all right? You can think about intubation early. If you're going to do that kind of stuff, it is like you're, that is a good reason to start an IV on a trauma on scene, all right? And again, I don't want to say that conscious sedation is wrong, all right? I'm just saying that I think it might be wrong with the National Registry. You want to really choose wisely. Like they want you to be a thoughtful paramedic and do what's best. So if maybe getting them to the hospital, getting them to the hospital with a basic airway, that, that would be what, what I would choose. Oxygen, pooling them. You will report to the hospital. Um, so for fluid resuscitation, it really becomes uh, more important when we're talking about 20% of the body surface area. Again, I usually knock that down to 18%. All right, it's awful because we're using the rule of nines. If we're at 18%, we really need to start thinking about fluid resuscitation. What is the formula that we use for fluid resuscitation? The Parkland formula. And so that's four milliliters times the body weight in kilograms, and then times that by the body surface area, the Parkland formula. Remember, we did that a lot in preparatory. Good, so we'll be doing that on quizzes again. Um, doing that gives you your um, 24 hours, right? And then in the first eight hours, they're supposed to be getting half of that amount. It used to be, and I'm going to try and get our nurse, uh, our, our burn unit nurse to come and talk to us for a couple hours, maybe just an hour. Um, when I used to have that quite consistently, the burn unit nurse would come and talk. And they would always said, just give them all the fluid you can. <laughs> Don't worry about fluid, just give them all the fluid you can. They might have pumped the brakes on that a little bit, all right? But I think in the pre-hospital side, we're not going to give them too much fluid in the first 30 minutes, all right? So in the first 30 minutes, we should be concentrating on probably starting two IVs and giving the first liter of fluid. We should probably get that first liter of fluid in. You don't have to like go around the block before you get to the hospital, but you shouldn't be afraid to give that first liter, maybe even working on your two, two liters. And then pain, all of the things that we just talked about for our pain management. Burn shock, look at sets in during a six to eight hours, all right? Like four hours, I'll give you four hours, but it's not immediate at all, all right? So if you have signs of shock right after a burn, look for what else is wrong. Mortality increases if fluid resuscitation is delayed by more than two hours. When we're talking about that, remember the consensus formula. Um, we do the Parkland formula. And then consensus is half of that in eight hours. This eight hours is the time of the burn. All right. So if we're getting to them four hours after the burn in the first four hours of care, they should get half of the Parkland formula. It's not after we start care, if there's a delay there. Specific burns then, circumferential burns, um, why, are, why are those bad? Circumferential around your arms and legs, that's it. Why is that bad? Then you've just lost all that protective layer for that whole extremity. Yeah, tell me more. Um, then you can't regulate or feel or um, there's no nerve endings anymore. Yeah. It's going to put pressure on your tissue. I know it's pressure and around your chest is bad because you yeah. run the risk of breathing, but as if you have risk or for scrotomy, I guess. So. Yeah. So when it's in the extremity, it's the, it's the same story as compartment syndrome, right? So that edema of the muscle causes there to be a lack of blood flow to the muscle, and you're basically going to get this huge amount of pain associated with ischemia to the muscle, not the burn anymore. So they get escarotomies for that. They just burn right through the thing. If it's the chest, the chest can't inflate, is that a good way? 
can't have extrusion of your chest. And so you have escarotomies of the chest wall too. A flash burn, we usually think of that with, uh, with airway stuff. Inhalation injuries, we talked enough about that, I think. Remember cyanide and carbon monoxide. And then chemical burns. Um, what, what we have to do with chemical burns, again, is brush off the powders and then hit them with a bunch of water. And that is, just like we talked about in toxicology, that is a firefighter, EMT, paramedic thing. We shouldn't say, this person has to get to the nurse because they know how to use water so much better than us, all right? So we sit on scene and, and decontaminate patients and not extend the problem all the way to the ER. So what do you think about this guy? What kind of things are you seeing? Swollen lips. Maybe swollen eyes, eyelids. How about his hair? So the, uh, we have a little bit of blisters there. So we're talking about partial thickness, swollen lips. And what do we worry about most? His airway. And then it says, what's his, what would we call this guy's burn percentage? Uh, let's give him, how old do you think this guy is? Seven. Seven, all right. Everybody good with that? So we, we're we probably talking about his whole head being 9%. You can go with 9, 10, 11% if you wanted to, if you uh, jumped on that one, two or three year old thing. And, it, and we don't know that a back of his head is burned. So we I, I don't mind a nine here, but seven or eight would be, I think, a pretty good thing too. Let's see if it has, no. So here's an escarotomy here for a burn circumferential or so around the person's chest. Burn progresses as long as substances remain in contact. So when we're talking about chemical burns, we have to get those chemicals off. Try and get a good MSDS, get some good information about the chemical and uh, while you're spending there drinking coffee, having the firefighters douse them with a bunch of water. Brush particulate matter off first, and doesn't matter what it is, it gets hit with water, lots of water. Before we hit it with water, it has to be lots of water. Acid burns, uh, easy to neutralize, and they cause dest destruction and coagulation of tissue. So when you have an acid, did we talk about this already? <laughs> so acid falls on your skin, you get burned, right? And then that, what is the worst, worst tissue damage that I could get with that acid burn? What do you think? Full thickness burn, right? We could get a full thickness burn. And then that's, that tissue, if it's full thickness burn, what do we call that tissue? It's a short word from escarotomy. So what is the tissue called? Escar, all right? What does a Mandalorian have? Isn't that Buscar? Ooh, that's good. So this is Escar, all right? So Escar from an acid burn. Now more acid is going on. Not a problem. Just going to go any deeper. We burnt that down to the basement membrane. It's bad enough, right? When we have an alkali burn, the term that they like to say is liquefaction of tissue. So that will just continue to burn and burn and burn and burn. That will go much deeper, all right? So lye and all of the alkalis are gonna get much, that's a, a potential for a much more deeper burn. So this is what we do, wash them off. Brush it off, wash them off, remove all the clothes. So sodium, these are all the ones from our book then. Um, sodium metals, uh, this could be National Registry. I, I haven't seen it on National Registry. I've never heard anybody say, oh, make sure your people know about sodium metals. Um, but it is on a quiz at least. Sodium metals, you cover it with oil, which sounds like the wrong answer. So if I were making a question on the National Registry, you'd see it, all right? So where are you gonna get the oil? <laughs> what is that? Uh, it is the kind of oil that sodium metals are transported in. <laughs> That's what you use. So, like you guys, has anybody here burnt themselves with sodium metals at home? 
are you still facility metals, they probably have it in a place where they burn the pan so much. Exactly. Hopefully somebody knows how to do it. So um, here, when you when you're talking about sodium metals, it's an industrial application. So it's an industrial setting. OSHA is going to demand that they have the stuff there. The protocol is what that sodium metal was transported in, which is an oil that goes on, on the skin, that goes over it. And that, because sodium, all of those metals burn with air, all right? The water and air are both bad for all of those things. So we cover it with oil. Hydrofluoric acid, again, it's probably industrial, right? Nobody's burnt themselves lately at home with that. Somebody um, from the class today had a hydrofluoric acid inhalation. Uh, and the guy was in SVT. <laughs> so calcium chloride jelly may reduce the injury. All right. So they take you take your calcium chloride, mix it with your saline jelly, put that into four by four, five by nine, and put that over the injury. The hydrofluoric acid leaches calcium out of your tissue. All right. That's how it kills tissue. So given that back will limit the progression. Gasoline is soap and water. Hot tar is immerse them in cold water and make it cold tar uh, and let the nurse peel it out of their skin. All right, so that will get peeled off later. We're supposed to cool it so it doesn't progress. That's kind of easy, right? Hot tar, immerse them in cold water. Here's the same slide as we had before. This is this basically is a, a discussion of water solubility. Remember, we talked about probably the uh, gas in Ypres, <laughs> Belgium. <laughs> and here, if something is highly water soluble, ammonia, um, hydrogen chloride, which is the weaponized, um, when you get exposed to it, it happens to your face and eyes and nose. All right. Usually you get away from it and that's it. You go, ah, and that's, and it's only upper airway problems. Chlorine is moderately water soluble. We usually talk about chlorine um, in this way. A site of action depends on the concentration. So it can be super uh, like immediate, closing eyes and all of that, or uh, you know, less concentrated. It may take a little longer. And then stuff that is slightly water soluble, um, usually it's uh, a different word besides slightly, not negligibly, but something else. And then FOSB, phosgene is usually the word that they use for that. And what you need to know, like when you're reading the MSDFs then, and it says it's slightly water soluble, it means it's gonna take longer for you to have an effect. And that means you will breathe it in. So then we start to see pulmonary problems, not this upper airway things, it's down in your lungs because you allow, you stayed in there longer because it wasn't a soluble. Now it's down in your lungs, slowly making its way through the tissue, and then it's gonna give you your problem. Electrical burns, uh, again, what, when you get hit with AC electricity, how do we get exposed to AC? Where is that? Yes, exactly, so it's right there. So AC is what is your 110, 115, 220, 221, whatever it takes in your house. All right, you guys know that 220, 221, whatever it takes. A movie, Mr. Mom, um, with Michael Keaton. So when you get shocked with AC, uh, what do we know happens to our body? We get shocked with AC. It tickles. It tickles. <laughs> Now let's bring it up to 220 or 440, and we're getting hit with it. You're not going to talk. Oh, it's a jolt arrhythmia. What what arrhythmia? Would you worry about? VTAC. VTAC. So VTAC, PVCs, runs of VTAC, multifocal PVCs. Those are the ones that we worry about with AC. AC causes your muscles to contract. So very often, if they touch it, then their, their hand goes and they have a longer exposure to AC. And so we have 60 cycle interface in America. So when that's happening, 60 times a second, they're getting, they're getting shocked by electricity. Puts their heart into 
hope, hopefully not ventricular fibrillation is kind of a pessimistic story. So uh, VTAC, let's say, or runs in VTAC, they can have a longer exposure and they can have a lot of tissue damage. Electricity follows a path of least resistance. It's going to go through vessels and nerve supply. All right. Big entrance or big exit. Uh, big. You can have an entrance and an exit. Let's go with the normal thing. Entrance and a bigger exit. Everybody good with that? Your exit can just blow off a hole like it can just blow you out at the knee. The rest is gone. Um, but we really don't need, it's not the same as like the ballistics kind of stuff. You just need to know there's an entrance and an exit and you can say, okay, they entered here and went through there. So all of this tissue can be compromised and that could have gone through the heart, could have gone through the lungs, could have went through your liver, could have went through your kidneys and damaged those tissue. If you get hit with DC, what's the expected rhythm? <laughs> asystole. Right, so asystole. But what is then going to happen? If you, if any of us got shocked with DC, if it's high enough, whatever words you use in electrical stuff, <laughs> you get put into a systole, then what? What's the next part of the story? You'll come back out of it. All right. AEDs put you into a systole with the thought that your SA node will pick up the ball later on when the, when the reset is over. Um, electrical burns, the degree of tissue injuries related to the resistance of the body tissue. Don't put your tongue on stuff. The intensity of the current and the duration of the exposure. There's your AC and DC stuff. Electricity follows the path of least resistance. There's a pretty bad exit kind of wound there where you can see the bone there. Um, there could be a true electrical injury. You just touched it. It could be arched to you where you're not really touching any of that. And we also can get a flame burn from electrical current. You're just going and having to, now you have a thermal burn. Electrical burns have a strong possibility of severe internal injury to your heart, to all the muscle. It can, uh, your nervous system. It can stop you from breathing for a while, kind of reset your respiratory. Um, and then rhabdomyolysis is another big thing. And the compartment syndrome, all of that kind of stuff is uh, are factors when we're talking about taking care of an electrical burn over a few hours. We are going to skip some things, all right? You guys can go look at all of these. Let's see if I can do this. Um, the next probably 15 or so slides are going to be burn patients that I put together. All right. Um, I guess we'll keep them. Boom. The uh, what percentage of burns is that? Yeah, I think this is good. This will bring us to town. What do you think? Burned in the abdomen, anterior abdomen, uh, circumferential around the arm, let's say. Let's see. Boom. Hey, good job. Happy face. Did you just click forward? <laughs> so a six-year-old boy jumped into a hot tub. Wait, the temperature was way too hot for him. Circumferential burns around his legs. That's what the parents said anyways. Um, from his nose or from his toes to looks like a little past his knees, right? Blistering almost everywhere. What's his burn? Are we using the rule of nines like eight, uh, nine and nine and nine and nine? Six year old boy. I think 32. Oop. And there's your burns. And then here's, oh, oh, here's your number. Nine and nine and nine. Nine times four is 32. No, it isn't. I like 32. So nine times four. Does anybody want know, know what nine times four is right away or not? <laughs> 36. 36, right? Because with the nines, you know, I can add their numbers like two plus seven and three plus six and five plus four and four plus five, all of those. Good. Right. <laughs> so, and remember, they're smaller. Our legs are 18 for this leg and 18 for that leg, right? Exactly. Less than that. 
and then you can maybe subtract a little bit because he's a littler kid. Remember that, seven, 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 seven. Mm -hmm. Your patient was tasked with lighting a fire to burn some brush and tree branches. He ended up spilling the gas on his leg. His cigarette touched off the flames. He was able to take his pants off, burn his legs. He has blistered burns all over the anterior lateral aspect of his left leg and anterior medial aspect of his right leg. That's what he looks like. What is his percentage? So it's not all the way around. It's anterior medial, anterior lateral. Just what you see is what is burned. Oh, look at his hand. Oh, dang. Yeah, it looks like his hand got burned too. Just the back of his hand. <laughs> looks like he also has an evisceration. So. And his lip, he got cut on his foot. So he's messed up. Any guesses? I don't know how much the army are counting in there. I'd say it's either 12 or 16. 20. Damn. Each leg, 9%, right? Because it's half of his leg, would you say? Yeah. Um, so plus the back of the hand and the wrist would be a couple of percents, right? Your There's a rule of palm. Your palm is 1%, all right? Annie opened the back of the large box truck that was filled with styrofoam package, styrofoam packaging. This actually happened in Byron Center. Uh, if you put styrofoam in the back of a truck and then let it sit there in the sun for a bit, I don't know if the sun was the important part there. I, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so they opened it up and lit a match and blew up. A, a boy and his or a father and a son. <laughs> It was like a flash over flame and, and was enough to throw their bodies backwards. Not like threw it to the next county or anything. The, uh, well, I don't know. I, I would have thought styrofoam. They did, probably didn't realize it was. It was I didn't know. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Why are they like match though? Because they want to fire. Yeah. <laughs> we could have been smoking. I don't know. Just a. A flash over that occurred using her lighter to shed some light on the contents of the truck. Um, yeah, thrown back 12 foot from the truck and was burned to the chest and face. The way that uh, Byron Center fired, Steve McBride told me the story, is the son, there's nothing wrong with the son, the dad got burned up. So what's the percentage? And I think we said chest. <laughs> chest and face, what do you think? Four to five for the face. Nine to eleven, maybe for the chest, because it goes down a little bit. Your next patient, thirty-seven-year-old police officer inside a car, pulled somebody out. Circumferential burns. Firefighters take care of them. Circumferential burns to the right arm, and burns to the anterior chest. This one is a, a military guy, and the, the big part of this was, um, what do you think the guy was wearing that caused this burns? And this was like before 2006. Oh, yeah. yeah, Under Armour. It was un the first uh, Under Armour. It's flammable. They've changed Under Armour since then. <laughs> but uh, this was the old, the first generation Under Armour. A lot of military people were wearing that underneath their vests and such, and he ended up on fire. And uh, that didn't help. So what do you think? That was a pretty easy one then, right? So if we see his whole arm all the way around his arm and that chest, there's your numbers. Whole arm is what? Nine, Nine right? And then that much of his chest, that's a pretty good size amount of his chest, do you think? Mm -hmm. Probably more than 2% anyways, but it's not his whole chest. National Guardsman, Molotov Cattail, he's sustained burns over various anterior surface of his body, neck, chest, arms, and thighs. Where do you think this happened? It's a lash, it's not real, so not boring. So this is just training. So what's his percentage? It's hard to say. Yeah, so 
Both looks like arms. anterior thighs, Both arms. abdomen, chest, anterior arms. Both anterior arms would be nine. nine, right? Nine, 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 and then these things, right? It's like a little bit of both sides. So if we go nine, 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 I'm not going to ask you the math, but that's three times nine is 27. Everybody who you on that? And we're going to go up from that 27 to get those thighs in there. So 33. There we are. Oh, the neck too, I threw in there. This guy is working on the railroad, he's blasting a tunnel. He stood a little too close to the explosion. Hollywood like ball of fire sustained burns to the anterior surface of his torso. Anterior torso, face, along with anterior burns of both arms. Again, this is moulage. So the anterior surface of his arms. Nine, nine, nine. And then we're going to add, so nine, 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 nine. Add that face. I also change the numbers here, so 31. Good. All right, this guy uh, minding his own business, and all of a sudden, Batman knocks him into a vat of acid. Uh oh, I already got rid of that one. Here's Callie, boiler furnace. I got rid of the Joker one. Anterior or that surface of her thing. This is the anterior surface of her arm, chest, abdomen, and face. You guys don't know Callie, do you? Oh, do you? She was here for about three weeks before she left. Oh, is that right? She's out of their place. She went to the state. Are we going to go with that uh, 29 or so? It's only one arm instead of the two arms. So nine, nine, not quite nine on this side, right? Four and a half. And then all of that face stuff. Aubrey, who also used to work here, took a flaming shot. Um, that's what she ended up with. Just those burns of her chest. There's not much other than what spilled over, over her clothes. We probably use something like rule of palms here and start looking at that so it's not all it's ba basically the back of the hand some of the forearm a good amount of the chest which is only eight or only nine and a lot of her face so maybe 18. everybody good on that every kind of get that and then this is the lightning when you get hit by lightning you get a ferning effect there's a lot of cool pictures on that Best treatment for lightning, don't get it. <clears throat> get inside. Where does, where do, when you're uh, confronted with a storm, where is it that most people get hit by lightning? Before the storm gets to them, in the middle of the storm, or after the storm is passed? Before the storm is there. Because <laughs> people haven't sought site shelter yet, is probably number one. But you, what you should realize well, as you're seeing the stuff come in, that's where people get hit with lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a forward edge is where you have a big disruption in the sky. And that's going to go forward and hit you before you think, and, hey, let's get out of the water. Remember, with lightning, you have reverse triage. And the rest is radiation burns. I have minimal stuff on radiation burns. National Registry, again, probably nothing there. Um, you need to know the three types. Um, when somebody has immediate symptoms, it's bad. <laughs> All right. And then uh, what we do is we treat what we see and bring them to the hospital. Since it's basically treat what you see and bring them to the hospital, I don't think there's going to be.